Hello, everyone. Welcome to our third SAVMA and Hills Diversity and Inclusion webinar, where we will be highlighting disability and impairment diversity with Dr. Danielle Rastetter, an incoming first year veterinary student at Ross University, Christina Wetzel. This webinar is part of a four part series where we will focus on various areas of diversity with members of the veterinary profession. My name is Jesse Coriel, and I'm the Cultural Outreach Officer for the student AVMA. I'm also a fourth year veterinary student at the University of Minnesota. Before we get started, I'd like to make a few housekeeping announcements. So first, if you could please make sure your microphone is muted and your camera is turned off throughout the duration of the webinar, that'd be great. If you have questions, please type them in the chat and I will field questions during and after the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and posted to our SABMA YouTube channel and the links will be sent to SABMA delegates for distribution. Before we get going with our webinar, I'd like to take a moment to thank Hills Pet Nutrition for their sponsorship. Without their support, this webinar series would not be possible. With us this afternoon, I believe we have Dr. Hilary Noyes. Um, Dr. Noyes, if you are with us, would you like to say a few words? All right, it doesn't look like she's actually on the call with us. Um, so we will just continue. So I would also like to thank designated interpreters for their interpreting services and their donation of closed captioning services to make sure this webinar is accessible to everyone. Designated interpreters is designed specifically to meet the needs of clients in the medical field. And we're very grateful to have them join us tonight. If you'd like closed captions, you may press the closed caption button on the bottom of your screen to turn them on. I will also be spotlighting our interpreters during the presentation so you will be able to enlarge their videos as needed. This can be done by clicking the single square icon to the left of the videos once the presentation has started and dragging the corner over to enlarge the box. And last but not least, I would like to introduce our speakers, Dr. Danielle Rastetter and first year student Christina Wetzel. First, Dr. Rastetter is a 1998 grad from the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine. She's the owner of Pets and Stitches, a veterinary clinic focusing on affordable surgery and dentistry, and is the co-founder of the Association of Medical Professionals with Hearing Loss. Also joining us is incoming first year veterinary student, Christina Wetzel. Christina will talk with us about the challenges she's facing surrounding accommodations for deaf or hard of hearing students in the intensive veterinary program and we'll provide ideas on how we as future colleagues can better support the deaf community. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rastadu and Christina. Uh, thank you, Jesse. So uh, just a brief overview, as you mentioned, um, I graduated you know, in 1998 from The Ohio State University, owned my own business since 2011. I'm also the cl clinical evaluator for my local community college veterinary technology program and work as a vaccination clinic veterinarian on weekends. And I am also on the admissions committee for the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine for file reviewing. So if there's anybody from us from Ohio State University, I might have looked at your resumes, I mean, your application at some point. I am deaf and I have bilateral cochlear implants. Hi, I'm Christina. This is my name sign. Christina Wetzel. I was born, I, uh, I entered Ross University as a first year. I'm still a new baby vet student. I also graduated from RIT, which is the Rochester Institute of Technology here in Rochester, New York. I also attended vet clinicals here in Rochester. I work at a small animal clinic and I've shadowed other veterinary mixed animal clinics here as well, both small and large animals. So I also have a cochlear implant and I, well, I have two cochlear implants, I have bilateral, but I am working with one right now. It's nice to meet you all. So I imagine most of you that are joining us, um, you will interact with those that have hearing loss 
primarily through a client basis. Um, so we are going to spend a bulk of the profession, I mean, the presentation talking about communication needs. Um, we will get into um, more in depth, especially within the veterinary community, like coworkers or yourself, if you um, might have hearing loss or sometimes there's age related hearing loss that will occur. Um, as you can see on the slide, hearing loss increases with age and there is quite a lot of it in the communities that we live in. So most of you may have heard, you know, about speech reading for those that are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, it is not a perfect situation. Many sounds look the same on people's lips. Um, some people don't enunciate as well. Um, and then medical terminology, if you are trying to explain to a client um, or a colleague a certain term um, that you may use, that can be difficult since part of speech reading is common words. You're used to seeing how they look on lips. Also, when you talk with people, as you get to know them well, you sometimes start thinking ahead and knowing what they're going to say. You learn your speaker, your speaker, you use cues, you know we're talking about the weather, so they might say something about how it's raining. Um, so someone who is a client especially, and you're trying to help communicate with them about their pet, they really have no basis to know what you're going to say. So it puts them at a disadvantage. Um, some of the things that you can do if you're trying to communicate is be aware about environmental noise. Um, I know in my practice, you know, my staff has learned that if there's noise going around, especially right now with mask on with COVID, they may have to wait till the noise um, stops or turn it off or come closer to me, which is the positioning yourself um, to the speaker. Um, they may also write um, handouts, email and texting these clients can be helpful. It can be somewhat labor intensive and slower, but if it's more effective, you get where you want to be on communication faster than having to repeat and repeat and go through that frustration. Um, and of course, body language. Some of you may be watching the interpreter too. You can see the facial expressions. You, as you get into emotions, they can really get into the body language aspect of it too. And that's really important. I mentioned the filling in the communication gaps too, and that has to do with um, trying to point or figure out how to use your environment, you know, point to the pet when you're talking about the pet, um, point to a picture or the radiograph when you're talking about the radiograph. Um, the people will repeat back. You can repeat something. If a, hard of hearing person or deaf person doesn't understand what you're saying, but be aware of falling in the trap of repeating the same thing over and over. If you have said a sentence twice and they still don't understand you, you really need to start trying to find either a different way of saying it, rephrasing it, or writing it, or another way of communicating the information. Um, it's just you have to be part of the solution in communication with that. Uh, Christina and I use uh, cochlear implants, that's assistive devices, hearing aids. Some people use um, things called FM systems, which help to decrease the space between the speaker and the person that needs to hear, um, where a speaker may wear a microphone or hold a microphone, and that sound is sent directly to the listening device that the deaf person is wearing. There are a bunch of varieties of assistive devices. Um, interpreters, of course, and be careful. People who aren't familiar with hearing loss think that interpreters, there's one type of interpreter, like the person that you're looking at right now. And that's more your American Sign Language interpreter. There's also cued speech, which is a way of um, communicating that emphasizes key sounds. And there's oral interpreters. We mentioned that speech reading can be difficult when you're trying to read somebody who you're strange, who's a stranger to you. You don't know how their mouth moves. So some people, and I even know a physician who has done this, has an oral interpreter because they then learn how that person speaks and they can speech read that interpreter instead since they don't know sign language. 
be careful legally you should not ask a family member or a friend that even if they're with that person to interpret um, you really need to put the effort into making sure the pet owner understands what is going on especially if you're looking to do something medically um, invasive um, or life-threatening or even a euthanasia you really need to make sure that the person who is the owner understands um, don't take the word for it of a family member or a um, friend there as you see right here with this presentation we have live captioning going on there's a slight lag but it is fairly effective there are speech to text apps that you can download on the phone they are not as reliable um, but they can be helpful um, environmental noise can play a role in that too for those of you that are getting close to graduating or business owners or working in a practice be aware that the costs for interpreters um, and in live captioning must be borne by the business um, according to law okay one of the key things as i mentioned in the beginning a lot of people will hearing people will assume that a deaf person knows how to speech read as I said, not all do. So ask the person you're trying to communicate how they want to communicate. And they are likely to use a combination of methods. Be aware, especially if you're getting into an emotional situation with a pet owner, um, or it's a long conversation, that hearing loss can be fatiguing. They're working hard to hear. They're working hard to speech read you. They might be working hard to do that while managing strong emotions about the situation going on with their pet. And it may take them a little longer to respond to you, to understand what's going on. Um, so have patience with that. Kind of common sense thing, but not like a lot of common sense, not also common. Get the person's attention, you know, gently tap them on the shoulder or wave to get their attention and stay in one spot. Don't walk around. Um, be aware, maybe if you have sunlight behind you, then maybe put your face in a shadow so they, if they speech read, so they can't speech read you. Even if they don't speech read, your facial expressions play a role too. So they should be able to see your face. Do not place anything in or in front of your mouth. Um, this has been especially hard for the deaf population with COVID lately. Um, we they're having to lower the mask um, wearing face shields can be an option um, that is just one thing that has been very frustrating i know some nurses hearing deaf and hard of hearing nurses that have been really struggling to work in their professions while um, trying to meet the criteria of the mask and the christina did you want to have something to say about that yes really mask Deaf people already rely a lot on lip reading. And so it's hard with a mask on that blocks people's ability. And, you know, also with hearing people in general have a harder time understanding each other and handling masks with coronavirus going on. So it's, it's a double-edged sword. Okay, yeah. Um, and you are speaking, just don't yell, speak clearly, speak normally, don't speak fast. Um, if you overpronounce or yell, you can actually make it more difficult. And um, so I mentioned some of this already. Use your visual aids if possible. Um, the radiograph, if you have a dog model, a knee model, an ear model, um, if you have um, other pictures that you can take. In this day with curbside services, um, you could maybe take a picture of what you're looking at in the patient that's in the treatment area, whether it's some dental disease, and then come out with your phone and talk to the person or text the person the picture. Um, but if you go out, you can talk to them and you have that picture. So that helps again. Um, those of you that are in the, um, that are working in businesses, captioning your videos for the clients. Some veterinary practices have um, ongoing videos that are way in the waiting room. Make sure those are captioned, be deaf friendly. Uh, make sure videos that you have for staff training are also captioned. And one thing a lot of people forget that's very frustrating to us is social media. 
um, we enjoy the social media videos too. We want to learn how to take care of the pets, how to um, clean the dog's ears, how know what's going on in your practice. Put that captioning on your social media videos too. So I talked about medical terminology. If you've got a new big word, um, pyometra, for example, maybe write that out, um, get a picture, you know, explain it, give them that basis to understand the word that you're going to be talking about first. Um, make sure you're open, using open-ended questions. Deaf people are notorious for saying they understand when they don't. It's sad reality. Uh, so just like good communication strategies with your hearing clients. I never ask, you know, is your pet eating and drinking? I always ask, um, how is your pet eating and drinking? I try to get more detail from them and ask those kind of questions for your deaf clients too. It's easy as we want to feel like we've communicated, that we've been successful. So we sometimes want to say, do you understand? And they might say yes, but they don't. So take that time to make sure they understand. Be mindful of the acoustics in your room, uh, dogs barking in COVID services, cars um, that have their engines on can be difficult. And then, um, as I mentioned, the emotions and the intent are part of the speech too. And you need to show that smile. Um, you look sad, you know, get excited, those things right there. We mentioned that if you things that you can watch for, because again, some people will say they understand, but they don't. And you can get things that make you suspicious. Um, if you have a family group and one person is not is hearing um, and the other one's not, if that if you see a slight delay, like that deaf person is looking at the hearing person and imitating their laugh or their body language you might be suspicious that they don't really understand what's going on. They just want to fit in. So they're responding how they think they're supposed to respond. Um, glazed eyes, blank stare. Again, long pauses as they think about what they want to say when you ask them a question. Again, you have to be careful. Maybe they're just trying to absorb um, what you said and respond appropriately. Um, and sometimes we turn and walk away because we don't hear you say our names or um, we don't turn towards you when you say our name and just not being rude. It's just um, trying that we don't hear you. And Christina is gonna get in here now. Okay, so really, Dr. Danielle talked quite a bit about communication with deaf and hard of hearing individuals, deaf and hard of hearing clients and people in general. And people in general don't realize what kind of needs that deaf people might have. It's really simple. You can just make sure that your face, you know, make sure you're not making too many facial expressions, make sure your mouth is easy to read, make sure you are involving facial expressions and body language because deaf people are very visual. Deaf people will also, I mean, hearing people can benefit from that as well. What's really important is facial expressions. Like I mentioned, facial expressions and body language. I wanna emphasize that again. For school settings, I do wanna mention a little bit about different ways that deaf people learn. And to make sure that there's a qualified interpreter, especially in higher level academic education. You know, you need somebody who specializes in medical language and medical terminology, potentially somebody who specializes in veterinary medicine. And so there are a lot of drug names and longer words, hospital names, all of the medical terminology that might come up. Those are complicated words and phrases. So having a qualified interpreter is very important. Also, as far as communication goes, you should talk to your TAs, your accommodations coordinator, anybody who needs to know how to communicate with you, because all deaf people and all hard of hearing people have various different communication needs. Some people are oral. Some people sign only, some people simcom and use a mix of the two. That means some people speak and sign at the same time. So everybody really has different needs. Also, typically deaf people like to sit in the front row. Generally, you're closer to the teacher. That way, if you rely on lip reading or an interpreter, you can see both of them in your line of sight. 
Also, make sure that the teacher can look you in the eye. If there's a large audience, sometimes their voice reverberates off the wall. So lip reading is really essential if you're sitting in the front row. Some students would rather have captioning. That's a service called CART, which is computer, I don't really remember exactly what CART is an acronym for, but it means live captioning. And it really, you can have an iPad or you can have a laptop and there's different equipment that actually has captions on it, which is nice because some people can save that for later and use it for note taking purposes. Also, some deaf people, some students have note takers for them. Because hearing students have the advantage of listening and writing at the same time. Deaf students do not have that advantage. So, well, it's, it's a lot harder for that to happen. So really you need to make sure that they can see the interpreter, they need to make sure they can see the teacher, so they can't really look up and down to write a lot. They'll miss a lot of information doing that. Also, as you mentioned previously, there is different technology and equipment that people can use. For example, hearing aids, cochlear implants, and those can help with listening and auditory skills as well. Those can assist in communication. Also, potentially doctors, vets, and other medical professionals have special hearing aids or special equipment that they use. For example, a special stethoscope. Um, they can hook it up to their cochlear implant or their hearing aid, and then they can hear through the stethoscope and hear the heartbeat of what they're listening to. There's also different kinds of visual stethoscopes that can be used, so you can see the heartbeat. There's quite a few options there. Also, if you're you know, already in a school setting, it's important for people to, both hearing people to understand that accommodations need to happen for deaf and hard of hearing people all the time. It's long, it, you have to be patient, you have to make sure that the accommodation is actually successful, and it's all really important that you eventually get to the right accommodations for everybody. You know, deaf people can lip read, but that's a difficult skill. It's exhausting if you have to do it every day. I think that I read only 30% of deaf people are effective lip readers, and so that's not 100%. So don't assume that a deaf person can automatically lip read or lip read effectively. Even a little tiny bit of sign, if you know one sign or two signs, that can go a long way for a deaf person. Sometimes it makes my day when someone signs one thing when I'm leaving the store, they just sign, thank you. That really makes me feel included and involved in our communication instead of missing out on what other people are hearing. So it's really nice just to have that basic communication skill or even just finger spelling. That's important to know just one or two signs can really make a big difference. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I have to say. So we're kind of reaching the end about um, communication here in that sense. Um, she mentioned that feeling, Christina mentioned feeling included. We realize that it takes more effort to communicate sometimes, and that can be tiring. You're basically asking people to do more work. We appreciate it when people who do take that work in and just be patient, have some empathy, and awareness of what's going on and how you're communicating. And just remember, ask them what they need to communicate with you, whether it be your client, your coworker, your friend, whatnot. So what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna shift a little bit and we're gonna talk about veterinary medicine aspect, um, about the deaf and hard of hearing within veterinary medicine. I am gonna read this out loud because this was, um, published by the um, Task Force on Healthcare Careers for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Community, their final report in March of 2012. And unfortunately, when people talk about diversity within any professions, they focus on gender, race, and ethnicity, mostly. Um, we want to focus on how looking at hearing loss, not as a lack, but other, rather as a gain. There are different skills that come in. We tend to be more visual, visual, I'm sorry, visual, spatial. And that 
is important when it comes to achieving social justice, equal educational and employment opportunities, and optimizing the economic contribution by all citizens. Um, we strongly believe, and we have seen it, not even believe, we know through studies that diversity in medicine helps to not only improve medical care, um, whether it be the medical care to animals or to people, um, but it also helps to form those connections and provide more diversity. So I'm gonna briefly go through my story. So I am I had to 48 years old. I am a practicing veterinarian, I own my own business, but it was a long road to get there. My hearing loss was progressive. Um, in an elementary school, I wore hearing aids. I wore the FM systems, environmental management, as Christina mentioned, sitting near the front, um, trying to control the sound or things like that. And I am one of those people that tends to speech read well. So my that is a picture of me with my first dog and she and my parents are how I got into being interested in veterinary medicine. So in high school, can I become a veterinarian? At that time, my hearing loss was um, definitely on the high end of moderate. I was having difficulty. My uh, father found three deaf and hard of hearing veterinarians. I don't know how he did it, but they became my pen pals. And they basically said, you can do it. Um, even met one of them. And one of them actually, um, two of them actually end up working at College of Veterinary Medicine. One is a board certified pathologist. The other one was a board certified dermatologist. And the third also owned her own business. So I had these ladies that had been successful and they told me that I can do it. And I used that opportunity to start thinking about what problems were, was I going to run into and trying to find solutions. As like all of you, when you were looking into getting to vet school, you focused on getting your experience with um, different species, um, your grades, your volunteer work, your leadership, but also I started looking at how am I going to manage classrooms? How, I mean, my classes at that time, even for undergraduate, I don't think I had a class larger than 30. I went to a small school and that school class was going to be 130 or more. How was I going to manage, sur manage surgery? I, surgical mask in front of the face. I speech read primarily. And of course, the stethoscopes, as Christina mentioned. And I started looking at the disability offices at the schools that I was looking at applying. During my undergraduate year, my hearing loss progressed to profound. Um, I was relying more on speech reading, definitely needed my assistive listening devices, um, difficulty on the phone too. So veterinary school um, was, there's only word I can say for it, traumatic. It was the first time that I ran into the fact that I really was deaf. There was a sign I was introduced to a long time ago, which um, means is a deaf hearing. It means a deaf person who thinks they are hearing. And that is what I had been up until vet school. I mean, I knew I had a hearing loss. I had lost my hearing. I was having more difficulty with my peers, sometimes social interactions, but undergraduate, I could control the environment. Clinicals, labs, people, the professor talking during anatomy lab, you know, 50 feet away. I don't know what they said. I'd have to rely on other people. Um, professors that were wonderful, that actually helped me find solutions. Um, then the professors that I actually had to go talk to the administration about. Um, one professor told me later that while he was happy I was successful, that he basically told me after I graduated, he said, it was a lot of work to teach me. And um, I didn't get the sense he regretted it, but it was a lot of work. And that comes into the embarrassing aspect, um, realizing I am asking people for help. That can be hard sometimes. Um, let me also back up a little bit too. When I mentioned that I did a lot of research, for those of you that are on here that may be struggling with a hearing loss, um, I really am a big advocate for being, for advocating for yourself, for doing research. 
you don't know all the answers, but I was told later that the reason that the Ohio State University accepted me into vet school was because I didn't come to my interview and say, I have a hearing loss, you need to take care of my accommodation. I came to my interviews and I said, okay, I've done a little bit of research. I have some ideas. This is what we're going to, I can try. I've already talked with the disability office. Um, I had shown, but I wasn't going to sit back and expect them to solve my problems. I didn't know the answers to everything and they did help, you know, with some other things, but you have to be advocate for yourself. You have to take care of your own problems too, to the best of your ability. And yes, you are going to need help. Um, I mentioned that vet school was traumatic. Um, clinicals were probably the worst. I do remember hiding in the back of the barn one time, crying, because I could not at that moment with that rotation figure out what was going on. And I was frankly tired of having to ask for so much help and accommodations and ask my peers for help. And um, that was a depressive episode sometimes during my clinicals, it was hard. Um, but I, I preserved, and I do remember that I cried um, during my graduation ceremony. So these are some of the things that I did during veterinary school, and that is a picture of me with my hearing dog uh, then. Um, we got a lot of advocacy, we doing extra work to make it happen. And Christina, did you have anything you wanted to say? Yeah, I have a couple of personal stories as well. Um, so I grew up oral. I went to elementary school and middle school and high school in a deaf program, but it was an oral only deaf program. And then when I went to RIT, I picked up sign there. Before RIT though, I went to Lake Erie College, which is in Ohio. Um, and I was the only deaf student there. You know, there was an entire hearing campus and I was the only deaf student, which I was pretty used to because I didn't grow up with a lot of deaf people, but in Lake Erie College, that was such a different experience because I was the only deaf student. But it did teach me a lot. It was really difficult and I felt very lonely. There were no accommodations for me. There were no interpreters, no captions. The college promised they would eventually provide me with accommodations because they had a deaf and hard of hearing student list, but they never actually gave it to me. And I fought for a long time and there was no success there. And I realized I wasn't gonna be successful in that college. So I decided to transfer to RIT and that's in Rochester, New York. It was, it was amazing. There's an amazing community there and there are so many deaf and hard of hearing people that are so diverse and everyone's different. I met so many amazing people in Rochester and people seem to be more open-minded there, especially with deaf people. I learned a lot in Rochester and I still live here. I still live in Rochester today. Also, so I, um, I grew up in a small town, so everyone was very closed-minded there. And then Rochester, everyone was very open-minded. Today, I've started Ross University, and you know I fell in love with that school as well, even though I've never actually physically visited the campus. People were already friendly, and the professors were from different countries. They, you know, they were American, Canadian, European. And I'm very interested in that because they also have different accents. So now I don't feel as alone, even though they have an accent and I have a deaf accent. So it almost feels like I fit in with them. I almost sound like a foreigner. I sound like I sound like a foreign English speaker. So I've actually really enjoyed that. And now I'm actually taking online classes, online courses for the first semester. And that's been a really big challenge. I've persevered through it and I've found a way to figure it out, but I'm very excited to move to St. Kitts soon and actually do it in person, hopefully when the coronavirus has, you know, run its course. Um, so oh, also, okay. also really quick, 
um, I wanted to mention, I first wanted to become a vet because, you know, I met Dr. Rossiter when I was 10 years old and my mom and I had driven to Dayton, Ohio. We had driven together to meet you and we had met you in a restaurant and you had talked about your experience as a deaf vet. And I had never heard of a deaf vet before, any deaf or hard of hearing vets, even deaf and hard of hearing doctors I had never heard of before. And so that really had an amazing impact on me. And I told my mom on the way home, we had been talking about the presentation and I said, I want to be a vet just like her. And then I ended up meeting two deaf vets here in Rochester, which was really nice and a really cool experience. And everyone has their own way and their own communication styles and methodologies. It was good to meet you too, Christina. Um, so it can be difficult to be someone with a hearing loss and get a job, um, no matter what field you're in. I, my jobs were both those that had known me beforehand were open-minded or had um, knew others with a hearing loss. Um, I chose to be upfront with my clients about my hearing loss because it was profound at that time. So that way we can promote communication. I would just introduce myself with my name and said, I have a hearing loss. I need you to look at me when you talk. Um, the, eventually my hearing loss progressed to death and I decided to get a cochlear implant. I could no longer function on the phone without voice carryover. I could no longer use my amplified stethoscope. I had to um, use palpation, radiography, ultrasound, other ways. And of course, again, with that, without doubting my professional competency, there was a bit of a depression on that. I was lucky I um, do very, very well with my cochlear implants now. Um, people that knew me back in vet school can't you know, believe that what a change it is. But I want to um, talk a little bit about, as Jesse um, noticed when we um, go introduced, is that I was in part of a nonprofit founding. Um, during vet school, I had deaf and hard of hearing individuals interested in various medical professions, um, physicians, wannabes, veterinarian wannabes, um, nurses, and then I also had um, professors from other schools start contacting me, um, disability offices. Because I think, because um, there were a lot of publications with, about me over the years, um, my achievements, and they were asking the same questions that I was asking. Um, how do you use a stethoscope? How do you communicate with clients? This was in 1997. And this, in the ADA, the American Disabilities Act, was passed in 1990. So we were starting to see the fruits of that and seeing the doors open and people with hearing loss were starting to see that they could become what they wanted to be and could get into the medical field. So that's why this push was starting to happen for information sharing. Um, because they asked me the same questions over and over, I started a listserv then, um, kind of like Facebook uh, group then, so people could make friends and network and help answer each other's questions because we all, I'm oh, sorry, uh, sorry, because we all um, communicated differently and had different needs. So I couldn't answer everybody's questions. At the time I found um, an organization called the Society for Hearing Impaired Physicians and met a few of them. And that gave me the idea to expand, to include a group, a formal group in all medical professions. I worked with five others to establish a nonprofit in 2000 called the Association of Medical Professionals with Hearing Losses. Lots of different medical professionals um, in there. And our focus is on facilitating the development of accessible healthcare solutions and techniques, um, technology, such as um, auscultation tools, as Christina mentioned, there's Amplify stethoscopes, there's visual stethoscopes. Um, and also what's happened that I never really foresaw, but now Christina is seeing the fruits of it, is um, promoting med specialized medical interpreter training. And I think that's wonderful. Um, and of course, networking and mentoring, uh, connecting people for mentoring like Christina and her parents found me. Um, 
there was a lot of information even then there was a lot of information about how te technology and stuff for just your everyday population that needed deaf person that needed to communicate but we didn't have that information about how do we deal with hearing needing to hear an iv pump going off that was a huge question with a lot of the nurses. How do they clear the code going off? How do they communicate with the paging systems? Um, you even see that in veterinary medicine in the larger facilities. The networking was extremely important. Um, we now try to meet every two years with the conference. My first conference um, was in 2000, 2001, I can't remember, it's been so long. But the emotional impact of having people who understand what you're going through. Um, when you experience discrimination and prejudice from any source, it knowing somebody understands, really understands, not just empathy, but really understands, is really important. On my flight home after the first episode of meeting everybody, I just cried because it was overwhelming having that friendship and those friendships have lasted decades and that is very important just like i expect i'll probably know christina for the rest of my life now too um ample has also this is really important if you are um working in a business in veterinary medicine even if you're hearing we have been involved with open, opening doors in legal cases that set precedents we have now offered a pool of expert deaf, deaf and hard of hearing witnesses that have been called to the stand in legal cases. Um, obviously, examples of successful medical professionals with hearing loss showing that it can be done. Um, Ample has been part of writing legal briefs again. So the, the world that Christina is facing now is a lot different than it was 20 years ago. And I'm really glad that we're seeing the fruits of a labor that she can use. Um, and again, becoming a resource of information. So if any of you who are here, you know, have a coworker or um, are looking at hiring somebody and you're wondering, how am I going to deal with this? You know, what resources are there? You can reach out to Ample. Um, if we may, if we can't, the first person you reach for may not answer. We know somebody. Um, people email me all the time and I say, I don't know, but I can find you somebody who can. We also do emails and blogs to um, people. And um, a quick thing, we are running out of time, but again, that task force. I wanna briefly mention this um, for those in the education field and those that are or may eventually own businesses. There is a discrimina discrimination going on in two aspects that I am very concerned about. Um, hold on, I think my video came off again. Let me turn it on. Okay, I'm sorry. The um, discrimination is in the technical standards, which are what veterinary clinics use to screen their applicants. These um, are written in such a way that preclude individuals with disabilities from assessing medical and healthcare training and employment. And what it comes down to is what's called an organic model versus a functional model. The organic model is how these technical standards to get into veterinary school have been written for decades. And um, here's some examples. I'm going to give one from my alma mater, the Ohio State University. The student must be able to communicate efficiently and effectively in both oral and written forms using English. Well, some deaf and hard of hearing people, that's not how they communicate. Um, and they don't, they're not going to. Um, and then there's some other examples that you can read. Michigan State kind of saves themselves a little bit with the area in the red where they say that they can, when their ability to communicate is compromised, the matriculant must demonstrate alternative means and or abilities to meet the communication skills. So hopefully you can see that this um, closes some doors as the way it is written. It kind of sets things up for a battle. It's something that if um, an admission committee doesn't want a student with a hearing loss to come on board, they can hold this up. And this also applies to other disabilities too. There are standards about um, vision, um, about mobility too. They are there in almost every veterinary school's technical standards. Here's an example of what it should be. 
the student must be able to communicate effectively with patients and family, physicians, and other members of the healthcare team. The communication skills require the ability to assess all the information, including the recognition, hold on, sorry. <laughs> okay, including the recognition of the significance of nonverbal responses and immediate assessment of information. I am very sorry, I'll let you read that while I'm trying to get my video back on. Okay, um, apologize. So this basically opens the door for different ways of communicating. And that is the way that it should be. Employment is also an area that discrimination occurs. I, hold on, I am trying, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get it back on. Okay. Would you like me to take over? I'm happy to if you, oh, no, you're back, Never mind. I'm sorry, I'm trying. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, so here's an example. This isn't hearing necessarily, but um, job requirements. You know, again, understand and follow directions and communicate with others. It doesn't say anything about how you do that. Um, a lot of times some people will say must have uh, fingertip dexterity in order to work with small or delicate items. These are actually my job descriptions. And um, instead of saying how it's done, I just say, you have to be able to do this. How we get there is up for debate. You have to be able to do the functional task, not organic. Um, and so the uh, transport 40 pounds frequently throughout the day. If I have somebody apply that has a mobility um, challenge, you know, we have to then discuss, this is a job requirement. How are you going to do it? You know, I leave it open. It doesn't exclude someone. Okay. So, and I do want to make a quick point that having deaf and hard of hearing individuals, um, I am so sorry. Having deaf and hard of hearing individuals, um, we have benefits. We tend to be more attuned to um, the so we tend to be more sensitive regarding communication skills and what's going on around us, aware of the environment and our situations. And um, we also, I have found in my case, at least, I will pick up heart murmurs that my hearing peers won't because of my stethoscope um, technology is um, very good. Um, we also tend to understand those that also face discrimination in the veterinary field, be more sensitive to that occurring, um, whether it be a client who may be um, experiencing something or a coworker or an employee. So there is a benefit to hearing diversity. Um, and I do want to give a thank you to designated interpreters for their work today and some of my colleagues for their assistance with this presentation today. If you are looking for any other resources, these are some. And if you would like to talk to Christina, I don't have her email on here, but I can definitely get you in touch with her if you'd like. Christina, do you have anything else to say before we end? Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this beautiful presentation. And also I wanted to talk about awareness is so important, specifically within the deaf community, because you can't assume that that person can always understand you. I briefly have a few quick little stories related with awareness. If you know, a very quick story to talk about. Recently, I think maybe a few weeks ago, I, as I mentioned, I'm taking online courses right now, and that's through the formal vet school. However, there's one professor who was just presenting normally, she had a PowerPoint, and it was all pictures. There were a few short words, but mostly pictures, and she was just speaking through everything she was talking about. There were no sentences. There was nothing in the PowerPoint to indicate where she was in the presentation. So I asked her if it would be possible for her to send me her notes or if there's anything that she was saying verbally that will be included in the test that if that could be sent to me. And she sent back, that's why you should be listening. And that's why you should be taking notes at the same time. 
And that was kind of an awkward situation for me because I rely on interpreters and she didn't know that I was deaf. So she didn't know that she had a deaf student in the class. So I told her that I have interpreters present and I can't note take and watch interpreters at the same time. It's not possible. So I need to rewatch the whole lecture video in order to note take. And I have to pause it a lot and take notes and that's just not an effective strategy. It was interesting because some professors, even you know, hearing students have challenges with listening sometimes, or it's hard to hear, maybe they can't take notes at the same time for another reason. So maybe they have a learning disability or another reason. It's hard, but you cannot always assume that people can note take and listen at the same time. So that's why awareness is so important. Another situation came up related with my job where I was working. This is before I came into vet school. I used to work with relief vets, which is when a vet gets pregnant, she has to leave on maternity leave. So they'll bring in a new sort of sub veterinary employee for about three months. So while the other vet, you know, continues their job, but they'll come back when they're pregnant. So it's just during their maternity leave period. So the other person knew that I was deaf, but she found it hard to communicate with me. She found it hard to work with me. And it was a challenge working with her because, you know, one time I came into the exam room with her. I was her assistant in that moment. And she had wanted me to look at something. So I was looking down and I was not paying attention to her at that moment. And she got mad and was trying to get my attention. She threw a pencil at me. She threw a pencil at my head trying to get my attention. And this was in front of a client. And so I was a little bit embarrassed because, you know, I didn't know, I didn't hear her. So that was a little bit embarrassing for me. So really, and that situation was resolved. The conflict was eventually resolved and, and we're good now, but that was definitely a challenge. Another time I went, I was in a shadowing at a mixed animal veterinary clinic. And this was a farm, so we had to call and go and, you know, arrive at their house early. It was a lot of driving involved at this situation. And so there was an assistant there who was communicating with me. And I was sitting in the back, back seat. And obviously, it's hard for me because I can't lip read in the back seat. I can't hear what they're talking about. And they realized, oh, Christina's deaf. You know, she, the girl in the back, she can't hear anything we're talking about. So what they did was they pulled up on their phone, the assistant, she had an app called Ava and she had actually downloaded that app and spoke into it. And I could look at the phone and see what she was saying. It had automatic captions that were generated based on what she was saying. And so I could talk to the assistant directly and which was so nice because that way I could be included in their everyday day-to-day -day conversation. And now it felt, you know, maybe that might feel like nothing to some people, but really that felt so nice to me to be involved in their day-to-day -day conversations. And I could add something or I could comment if I wanted to talk about what they were talking about, you know, and I'm still learning. Maybe they're talking about different cases that they've had. Maybe they're talking about what's going on with the pigs or with the, you know, different animals that are around. What's wrong? What are we going into? What's the situation? And so it's nice to be able to be included in that discussion, in that conversation. So that was just, that was just a really nice moment that I had. Really, I just want to emphasize how important awareness is because that's just the most important thing. Everyone is different and everyone has their own needs. Um, so yeah, I just want to, and again, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to Dr. Rasser and thank you to the interpreters and thank you to everyone who came today. Um, I can type in my email in the chat. I'm happy to do that if anyone is interested in contacting me. We do have a few questions in the chat. Uh, one was from Holly. She said, um, what role do you feel legislation should have regarding interpreters in veterinary medicine, especially surrounding euthanasia? I know there is no um, legal requirement as of now for an interpreter. Why is there such a gap between human and veterinary medicine when it comes to accommodations? I mean, the answer to your, my opinion, the answer to the last part about the gap is because human life is considered more valuable than animal life. Um, I do think from an ethical standpoint that 
I mean, I do think from an ethical standpoint as a business owner and as veterinarians that we need to make sure our pet parents understand what is going on with their pet, whether they're deaf or hard of hearing or um, have a learning disability or we need to find a way to um, explain to a visually impaired person what we're seeing on their dog's skin. It's communication and communication is so important. I don't know if um, there will ever be enough of a push to legislate interpreters in veterinary medicine. Um, I think it would be nice if it gets to that point, but I think at this point, it's just um, us doing the right thing as we should with everyone we interact with in communication. Um, let's see if there was another question. It looks like Ella is wondering what your experience has have been with clear surgical masks. Have you used those, Christina? Um, I haven't had much exposure to them yet. Okay. Um, I don't need them. I do sometimes have to control my environment. Um, I wear, as you can see in that picture, I like to wear a face shield. When I'm interacting with the clients, it does fog up some. Uh, fogging is an issue from what I'm hearing with some of the um, people that are using it. It's not perfect. There are different brands that are being out there, some that are self-made too, being, I do say in this COVID era, um, it's valuable and it's not just for hearing people. I mean, those who have hearing losses, um, children being able to see your face and your smile. Um, and I think it has its own value, but I don't have any experience. I just know I've heard it's not perfect. It can fog up. Um, it's a tool in your tool case. Um, let's see. So, so again, Jessica was saying that she loves the safe and clear surgical mask throughout her rotations. Um, and that is one of the things I did highlight in my presentation. Um, you, obviously wearing the N95 has going, is going to be much more difficult. I have heard that there is, um, they're testing an N95 mask that has a clear aspect to it. Um, but the test is in the testing stages right now because if this COVID stand, stays around, um, it's going to be beneficial in the human health field too, especially with those that are working with COVID patients. Um, there are a lot of ways that people communicate um, around surgical masks. I have used those voice to text apps when I'm at the curbside talking to a client. Um, I've had times where I just step back and they pull down their mask a little bit too. It's definitely a challenge right now. Any other questions? Um, but I guess there's another note. Um, there is sometimes also that is true. So if you're working with someone that is deaf or hard of hearing, um, being willing to sit with them um, afterwards to go over what they may have seen, a coworker, like what happened in that surgery, just can put some a loose ends together, help them understand it, or even taking the opportunity to give them something to read ahead of time so they're prepared for um, a situation that they may be running into medically with the care for a patient. Um, and then there was something about um, using some instruments and some signs for instrument patient status. Okay, so triage in ER medicine over the phone. Let's see, what was that question? Is VRS the best only option? Does the customer have to take on these costs? I honestly do not know, Holly. Um, if you want to email me later, again, I can probably put you in someone, touch with someone who can help answer that question in my video and it again. So Holly, feel free to email me later and I'll see what I can get you some information on that. Um, Danielle, can you also just elaborate on what VRS is? Um, um, yeah. Go ahead, Christina. I can elaborate a little bit on VRS. So that's video relay service. So I use that service very often. That's an everyday use for me because that's how I call people. That's how I call hearing people on the phone and hearing clients, but also hearing people in general. If there's an interpreter will pop up and they'll sign for me and then they will 
they will speak for me and then the hearing person will say something and the interpreter will sign it back to me. So it's a nice service. For emergency room situations and triage situations, I know I've talked for some deaf vets and deaf doctors and there's a one specialist individual person. Like for example, there's a person who accepts all of the you know, vet triage calls and interprets all the vet triage calls in the relay system. That person is sent all of the veterinary calls that's kind of burdensome, but teamwork is so important. In veterinary medicine, everyone works together. So communication is vital in that moment. So yeah. Did you have any other, anything else to add, Danielle? Um, no, Christina, I think you're probably referring to Dr. Kimberly Dodge. Um, she is an ER veterinarian. Um, and so if any, if Holly, if you um, contact me some more, I'll probably put you in touch with her, see if she might be able to help answer some questions for you about how she handles that. But I know she's been working at the same place. Um, it is in Rochester over a decade, I believe, if not longer. Um, okay. And I think- Also, um, I did notice that someone has been speaking about an oral transliteration or a captionist. I prefer having an interpreter because an interpreter can be a little bit more flexible and can run with you quickly if you're going somewhere. You don't have to rely on technology in that moment. There's a person. And so there's definitely a lot of benefits to using an interpreter as opposed to captioning. Um, really in a real life situation, like a clinic or an emergency situation where everyone needs to go quickly and be fast, sometimes an interpreter can be very beneficial there. Yeah, it um, actually was really interesting at an AMPO conference, we saw, um, they did a demonstration, and we saw how, in human field, how a code was handled by run by someone who was deaf, um, Dr. Christopher Moreland and his interpreting team, um, which include Todd Agan, and that was fascinating to see how they worked as a team to handle a human code situation. Um, and he, that's how many of them in the human field will do it. So, okay. Any other questions from anybody? Well, thank you for joining us. Feel free to reach out um, afterwards. And I know Christina and I both hope that this was valuable to you. Um, and if you, anybody wants more information on depth on anything, I will be happy to help. Have a good evening. And I, I'll just say a few words quick to close. Um, I just want to thank you all again so much for joining us this afternoon. And thank you Hills Pet Nutrition, Dr. Rossiter, Christina, and the designated interpreters team for making this webinar possible. A huge thank you to all of those who came and joined us tonight. It's so important that we learn about all forms of diversity and learn how we as future colleagues and civil servants can be accommodating in any way possible. As Danielle and Christina both highlighted, awareness is key and a great place to start. Um, they both shared their emails. I believe Christina was gonna put hers. Yep, I see it in the chat. Um, and then just a reminder, the link to this video will be shared on the SABMA delegates, or on the SABMA YouTube page, and then will be distributed from the SABMA delegates. So stay tuned for that. Thank you all again so much for coming. Have a great night. You guys have a wonderful night as well. Thank you so much for coming.